this group of messages that build kind of one right after the other. And today what I want to focus on is I want to focus on something that captures our attention, our imagination, our opinions, and that is a trial. For whatever reason, humanity is obsessed with trials. We're really just obsessed with mysteries that are related to trials altogether. So much so that today there are even television channels, not just programs, but channels that are completely devoted to nothing more than just exploring trials or broadcasting trials. For the past several years, there has even been a very large push for there to be some kind of network or television um, presenting of Supreme Court cases. Now, a lot of people in my generation are surprised when they find out that that isn't the case, that all that we really have is, is audio and snippets that are released here and there, but there is no television network, not even C-SPAN, actually presenting the trial. So when you get a, a little like recap of the Supreme Court, all you have is the stenographer's notes. You have the uh, person who's actually drawing the portraits of the, whether it's the Supreme Court justices or the lawyers or, or whoever, and then you maybe get a little bit of their audio. That's, that's as dramatic as it gets. And even then, uh, whether it's CNN or Fox News or whatever, they still try to dramatize that because there's just something about a good trial, right? That really catches our imagination. Some of you might remember the trial of the century. Starting with that dramatic car chase on the California freeway and then ending with a verdict of not guilty that divided the whole nation. Everybody had an opinion on that. And yet most of us have never even met O.J. Simpson or his deceased wife or, or who or anyone else related to that case. None of them, none of us know them personal. Most of us would never even, even like through seven people have a stake in what happened. And yet that trial captured America and we talked about it in a way at, where those were people in our lives. Can you remember going to dinner around that time and everybody in the restaurant? Everybody around the dinner table having an opinion? I always wondered what that did to Bronco sales, by the way. I wonder if they went up or down based on that. The Casey Anthony trial, another one where people tuned in. And this time, they tuned in not just to the trial itself, but all of the uh, opinions. People like Nancy Grace and others who would basically give you not just their legal perspective, but just their, their hardened opinion on whether someone was guilty or not. You could even say that we're living in an age where there are two kinds of trials going on. The trial in the courtroom where someone is supposedly innocent until proven guilty. And then the trial in the public, the trial in the public square whether that takes place in the media or in our homes or in our conversations. And it always seems like the person is presumed guilty until proven innocent. We love a good trial. We like a good trial even when the person is guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt and they even uh, say so. Uh, Sarah is uh, doing forensic psychology in her grad studies and she studies some of the most heinous crimes and people who have committed them. And trust me when I say this, that if anything ever happens to me, you will not find the body. <laughs> and I probably deserved it. Let's just, let's just put it at that. I, I am marrying an expert. And she ha will have me from time to time watch these uh, videos. And I'll, I'll never forget watching this uh, documentary series that followed uh, uh, one of the first, if not the first, female serial killer 
uh, Eileen Mornos. 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 And this is a woman who, who, uh, and, 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 you know, many reasons behind it, but even publicly proclaimed that she was guilty. And yet still America was transfixed on wanting to see her on trial. We, we love a good try. And there's some questions behind that, behind that, whether it's because some of us want to see justice done, or maybe more accurate, there's a somewhat bloodlust that exists in all of us. Where if we feel like somebody deserves some comeuppance, whether they're innocent or guilty, we want to see that come up and stitch down. There's a certain delight that we take when somebody receives a sentence of nine, you know, consecutive life sentences. And yes, there's even somewhat of a, among some of us, not all, but there's even a sense of gratitude when someone receives the death penalty that presents in us a strange feeling of for some safety and others joy at seeing someone get what they deserve in our estimation and i want to tell you my story about that because i really believe that it relates to luke 22 and 23 because there was a time in my life where I felt like okay if you you know take someone's life you're worthy of that you've already kind of seized that destiny in your hands and an eye for an eye and a life for a life and I think a lot of us think like that I think that's a primal part of, of who we are as humanity. And I also think that's a part of sin being in our world and us being influenced by the evil that so easily persists. And then my view was radically changed several years ago when I attended a dramatic performance put on by the Innocence Project in Long Beach where they went through the true life accounts of people that had been exonerated. Some who had sat for 10, 20, 30 years on death row, just waiting to be put to death. And then through DNA evidence or witnesses recounting their statements and recanting them, or, you know, an investigation that turned out to uh, have police misconduct within uh, the first trial and, and, and way things were put together, people were set free. And, and yet I'll never forget the story of one man who was presented, his, his fiance at the time, who was serving um, you know, a sentence and was on death row right alongside him. And she was exonerated and set free, but he wasn't. You know why? Because he was already put to death. And yet they found out that he was innocent. No justice for someone like that. Now I want to be clear today. This message is not about whether it's a just society should have a death penalty or not. That's for you guys and our lawmakers and, and whoever decide. But I want to talk about why we have such strong feelings about these issues. Our nation here in America is founded on the principles of justice. It is one of the big three branches that keeps our whole government in check. That sense of judicial responsibility. And we hold that dear. You know, just this previous election, which all of us are collectively trying to forget about as fast as possible. So many people cast a vote for the lesser of two evils. And, and I, it was interesting because so many of them, when they were citing 
the reason why they voted for a candidate. They said, well, I'm voting really for the Supreme Court. We care about trials. We care about the judicial process. And even in a nation where I think all of us could agree that we, we have a pretty good system in place, we all lament just how corruptible it can be, how imperfect it can be, how in many cases there are those who really get no justice due to their background, due to where they live, due to who that jury of their quote-unquote peers really comprises. We're always, ever, constantly looking at that sense of justice. And for so many of us, we feel like justice is not always necessarily served. That's what I want to speak to today. That's where this, this journey in the next three weeks, as we make our way to Easter, starts. Because we cannot explore the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus without looking at his trial. A trial in so many ways could be labeled the most unfair, the most biased trial, the greatest example of no justice being served. In Luke 22 and 23, you are going to see Jesus remain silent. He will say collectively about two to three statements. Matthew and Mark record the same exact account. John differs greatly, and we're not going to look at John today. And the reason why John presents a little bit different portrayal is because there's somewhat of an insight between Pontius Pilate and Jesus that John presents. But before John wrote his gospel, and that's way late in the first century, all that we know of Jesus' trial is pretty much the, present, the presentation of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we're going to look at Luke, and we're looking at Luke specifically because Luke's purpose for writing his gospel is to present an orderly account. Not necessarily a biography of Jesus' life, but sticking a little closer to the, the facts of what happened leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So look on with me at Luke 22, verse 47. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. That penultimate moment that we know of as the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion has passed. The disciples have a way to a garden to pray. Most of them have fallen asleep. And Jesus is in anguish. It says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leaving them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? One of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. This is your hour when darkness reigns.
the first thing we need to understand about the trial of Jesus Christ is that he was arrested under the most suspect and unfair of circumstances. The accusations that will fly about Jesus' character and what he intends to do won't be vetted out in the streets before people. It's all done under the cover of darkness. It's all done where prying eyes cannot see. And everything that happens in Jesus' arrest and trial is geared towards misdirecting and misinforming the people that have descended upon Jerusalem for a celebration of the Passover, a commemoration of an event in their history when they threw off the shackles of Egyptian slavery and where so many revolutionary figures are in town desiring for the Jews to do the same with Rome. So you are going to see the leadership, the religious leadership of these people cutting a deal with Rome, with their government, for the sole aim of getting rid of their chief competitor in their eyes, someone who is wooing away the attentions of the people. And Jesus, one of the very few things that Jesus even utters to anyone who is going to put him on trial, put him on the spectacle is, why now? Why now? They could have done it at any other time. They could have done it while he was in their own synagogues, when he was in the temple. If what he was doing was so wrong, so illegal, so heinous, if he was really an enemy of the state trying to whip up a revolt of Rome, if he was really blaspheming the, the religious leaders and scholars of their day, then wouldn't it have made more sense to really make an example out of him and arrest him in broad daylight? And Jesus says, you didn't do that. You waited for the hour of darkness. And I believe that Jesus is speaking so very, very clearly to something that we must face within our own society and within our own selves. When we express those opinions, when we are ready to cast our own verdict of whether someone is guilty or innocent on the most trivial things and on the most serious of things, do we do it out in the open where we can be held accountable? Or do we do it behind people's back? Do we do it with an anonymous comment on a blog? Do we do it, you know, behind the Facebook posts? And then when we hear the backlash, we immediately say, oh, I was hacked, I was hacked. I genuinely believe so many people have lost faith even in their own governments around the world because they feel that once someone goes and is supposed to represent them, they go and under the cover of night or in the back room, what do they do? They cut a deal that has nothing to do with the general wel welfare of their people, but more to do with towing that party line or advancing their own pursuits or careers, or quite frankly, just sticking some money in their pocket, all under the cover of darkness. Jesus's trial was not just because Jesus's arrest was not just. The writer of Hebrews, after all of these events, will remind us that we have a high priest, he's speaking about Jesus, who is able to sympathize with us in every way and yet was without sin. And that is so true because Jesus faced and experienced 
an unfair legal system. There was no justice for a man who healed so many, who fed the hungry, who gave literally life back to children. And the way that they arrested him was literally so shady. And there are people in our world who feel the same. And I want to tell you, I have a message for you. Jesus knows how you feel. He experienced it. It is a part of the core of our faith. There was no justice for Jesus. That Eve, when he was falsely accused and arrested. <clears throat> So what did Jesus do? Did he lawyer up? He said, because, you know, they really didn't have a case. I've often wondered and I've often pondered just how easily it might have been for Jesus to get off on the charges that he faced. And yet, in so many ways, Jesus offered no defense whatsoever. Look with me at verse 66. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. And they all asked him, are you then the Son of God? And he replied, you say that I am. Understand what Jesus is doing here. Jesus, is, Jesus already knows the inclinations of their heart. Jesus has already sparred with these people on so many cases and events. They are never, ever going to actually give Jesus a fair hearing before the people. They have already made up their minds. And so I love Jesus' response. Jesus does not banter. He does not try to engage them in any kind of a conversation that could lead to defending his actions or who he am. He just basically says, you have already made up your minds. And man, that speaks to something about us. It speaks to who we are and one of our greatest failings. I, I At the beginning of this message, I said, man, we love a great trial. I think one of the reasons why we just love following a great trial, because we love offering up our opinions whether people ask for it or not. Happens in the sports world all the time. Oh, that quarterback, he's really struggling. Well, we all know why. We say that, you know, but we've never been a quarterback in the NFL or a college. I can barely throw a football, to be honest with you. I was up at my bachelor party weekend getting away, and I was throwing the football with my best friend, Scott, and I was dropping back. And, oh, man, I had him in my sights, and I threw that glorious football. And you know where it ended up? Right on top of a car hood. Twack. And yet not 15 minutes later, we were all debating who the greatest sports star was and why this person was no good. And, and, and it just kind of hit me. We're all sitting around pretending to be experts on something that we know nothing about, really. We watch, we enjoy but we don't know their life, we don't know their experiences, we don't know their personal life. And yet an industry has been built around that. It's been built around that, and that's fun, but it's also been built around our politics, it's been built around our law, and we are all so eager to constantly retreat into our own camps. And rather than reason something out, just declare our opinions our, our own verdict of guilt and innocence. And Jesus is speaking to that experience. When he stood in the presence of the people who were supposed to be leading the faith of the people, he saw hardened hearts and made up minds. And you know my question for the church today, when, when truly lost souls, people who are struggling, struggling with the direction that they should be heading in life, find their way into a church. 
Are they experiencing warm hearts, open arms? A people that don't stand ready to judge, but a people ready to extend mercy, hope, direction. Is that what they're seeing? Or are they just seeing another judgmental face in the crowd that's already made up a mind, their mind about them? When I was a freshman studying theology, I uh, was in a class called Introduction to Ministry and Spirituality. And we watched the video testimony of, of a young man who was completely tatted up and down, piercings all over the place. And he was recounting how he, he walked into a church and no one said hello to him. He sat kind of not immediately next to someone, but kind of within the vicinity, and the people moved. And then finally, kind of their usher came forward and asked him if he was in the wrong place. Maybe he made a mistake being there. That's pretty harsh. So many stories like that. See, we read about the trial of Jesus Christ and we shake our fists and our fingers and we say, how unfair. And yet, in reality, we're susceptible to the same embarrassing behavior. And as Jesus calls these people out over 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit of God calls us out when we make the same error today. Just as the Sanhedrin court gave Jesus no justice, we are often giving little to no justice for the people who are seeking it in our world. And the reason is because of our own insecurities, our own fears, our own desire to control, our own prejudices. And that was the same recipe for what led Jesus to the cross. In Luke 23, it says the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you king of the Jews? And what was Jesus' response? You have said so. You've already made up your mind. And we come to understand that Pontius Pilate, he's in a difficult political situation here. He's got this Jewish holiday that's going on. There's all kinds of revolts and, and whispers of revolt in the street. Pilate has had a horrible track record for dealing with some of the revolutionaries in his time, so much so that even Rome is starting to say, hey, if you can't get things under control, we'll get you under control. And in the Roman Empire, that means... You're replaced, not just fired, you're, you're out of there. And so here comes the Sanhedrin court, a, a, a group of people who hated and despised Rome and Pontius Pilate. And here they are, kissing his ring and saying all the political things they need to. It's total political theater. You know, we'll say all the right things. You just take care of this problem for us. And when Jesus says, you have said so, he is speaking to the fact that there are two systems at work that are just working this thing out, and there is no justice. There is no justice for the man in the center of this trial who's done nothing wrong. Pilate announced to the chief priest in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man, and this is everything. Because Pontius Pilate, in declaring that, he tells you and I, he tells everybody who's heard this story, that no matter what was said about Jesus, no matter what bogus charges were brought against him, 
There was no reason for Rome to get involved. There was no reason for Jesus to be legally crucified, put to death, or even thrown in prison. He did nothing. Which is, is important for us to know because when he goes to the cross, and we'll look at that next week, and he becomes the sacrificial lamb that takes away the world's sins, he's not doing so as a criminal in the eyes of the law. He hangs on that cross because Rome cut a deal with these people. Now Pontius Pilate, he's a pretty shrewd politician. He finds out that Jesus is a Galilean. He's from Nazareth. And, you know, technically Pontius Pilate can kind of shirk him off. He can send him somewhere else. And that's to Herod. Herod can take care of this problem. So it says, Pilate asked if the man was Galilean in verse uh, 6. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Because at that time, the Herods and Pontius Pilate, they were trying to get along. They were trying to work out some of their differences. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased. Because for a long time, he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressed him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. And I want you to think about that. On this day when Herod and Pilate finally find common ground, and become political allies. One of the things that links them together is Jesus. Their failure to protect Jesus, who has done no wrong. For Pontius Pilate, it's a fear of what the people might do. And for Herod, it's because he's a fool. He wants to see a cheap parlor trick. He thinks Jesus is Chris Angel, and he wants to see a magic show. You know, I find it interesting. Jesus is willing to speak to the people who absolutely hate his guts and have been vying to kill him from the beginning. Jesus is even willing to speak to this Roman governor who is so swayed by the wind of, of what's going on politically that he's lost his spine. I mean, even so much so that he won't even listen to his own wife. Well, I'm finding, you know, I'm finding personally every day is a very good thing to do. But Jesus said nothing to Herod, who was from his home region. Herod, the person who should have understood Jesus the most, really comes out of the story being the biggest fool and the biggest embarrassment. It just reminds me that you can be close to the story, the message, the symbols, the religion, and yet be so far away from Jesus. Church, hear me today, whether you're here in this room or listening at home or online, you can be close. Never miss a Sunday school. Never miss a church attendance. Know the Bible frontwards and backwards, and yet completely miss understanding Jesus and what he's all about. That's Herod's testimony. And I find it so tragic and sad 
that the one who should have stood up for Jesus, the one who was in many ways a fellow countryman of his, is the one that ridiculed him. It really led the procession that would turn into Jesus, not just being crucified, but crucified in a disgusting, embarrassing public spectacle. No justice. In verse 15, it says, Paul, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers of the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and found no basis on your charges against him. Neither is Herod, for he has sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. And you know what's so sad about that? It just shows how spineless Pilate really is. Hey, Pilate has said now at least two different times to the people, to the chief priests, this, this man's innocent. But you know what? Just to make you feel better, we're going to flog him. We're going to punish him. See, that's that bloodlust. That's that bloodlust that exists in humanity. Where we want to see people punished, and I don't even know if it's because of what they did or because of our own desire to see the punishment carried out. You know, there, there's... Something to the fact that we want to see human beings just hit each other as hard as possible, whether it's in a boxing ring or a football field. There's just something to us that made those gladi gladiator spectacles in the Colosseum just okay for that time period, even though people were being put to death. And if you speak up about it, what happens? You roll your eyes and go, oh, man. What a weenie. Get over it. Well, that's fine, except for that same bloodlust that exists in humanity. That helped facilitate the death of an innocent man. And guess who that innocent man happens to be? Oh, yeah, the Messiah. Every single thing in Jesus' world that was meant to foster and support order failed him. There was no justice for Christ. And at this time, when we commemorate the, literally the hinge pin of history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we've got to spend some time in reflection about why that happened, because it's happening to people today. It's happening to families. And if we're not willing to address it, If we're not real willing to become a part of our communities, go to town hall meetings, know who our neighbors are. If we're going to continue to live in the same kind of fear that the television and the evening news and the 24-hour media circus presents, then we become the same carnival barkers, the same fools, the same spineless individuals who put Jesus on the most unfair trial in history and sentenced him to death. That's our choice. I'll punish him and release him, but the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Now, Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him.
crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then released. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. And that right there, that's the death blow. That's what this message today is all about. The shouts prevailed. We need to ask ourselves during this period of reflection, and I really hope Easter is a period of reflection for us all. Do the shouts prevail? Is it the loudest voice? that sways the decision, or is it really mercy and forgiveness, goodness and love? Are we so eager to see someone suffer because they've truly committed a crime and are deserving of it, or because there's something within us that we've not gotten a handle on? I want to share one more story, and we'll close this message. After the time of Christ, and not a long time after, just a short time after, there's a man by the name of Stephen who is doing nothing more than helping feed the poor, take care of widows, a part of a new movement, many of which thought was just kind of uh, uh, an offshoot of, of Judaism and people that would kind of get all their possessions together, sell the things that they didn't need, and, and put the money towards just helping people. That's what Jesus or Stephen was a part of. And through a series of unfortunate events, Stephen finds himself on trial before a bunch of religious zealots of the Sanhedrin court because he's been talking about Jesus, because he's been preaching about specifically an event, an event they say is impossible, an event they call a lie. During the course of their interrogation, where they begin to lose their mind and start chucking stones at Stephen with the intention of killing them, Stephen remarks that he sees Jesus, that he sees Jesus standing at the right hand side of God. And I want to call back to a verse I read today when Jesus said to really the same people, that same Sanhedrin court, the Son of Man will be at the right-hand side of God. And I want to share what that means because it's important. We are contending with evil in our world. And sadly, sometimes that evil, it's not just exemplified in the actions of someone who takes a life or kidnaps a child or burglarizes a home. Sometimes it's exemplified in the very system of justice that is supposed to protect citizens, but instead harasses, takes from them, pushes them down. And I believe one of the reasons why we as humans are so obsessed with that trial culture 
is we're trying to find in this world, this world of both darkness and light, some kind of justice we can found our lives on. Some true sense of right. And as Christians, I want to share with you that Jesus does indeed sit at the right-hand side of God. And what that means is that he advocates truth for us on our behalf. That ultimately, he is the judge. And when we live our lives according to him, when we love our neighbor as ourselves. When we live a life that is honorable in the eyes of Christ, no despot can stand against us. They can take our lives, but they can't take our faith. No system of government can ever corrupt that. Even when we seek to marry both together foolishly, I am telling you today that the same justice that was ultimately delivered for Stephen, even though it cost him his life, is available to you and me. And in our world, where we become so cynical of whether people can truly change, I'll remind you that at Stephen's trial, at Stephen's stoning, there was a man named Saul who saw it, approved of it, even held the cloaks of those who were casting those stones of death. And that man, that man Saul of Tarsus, he would become one of the great church leaders and thinkers and apostles. The Apostle Paul. And I promise you, I implore you, that that moment in Acts that the same gospel writer Luke writes about, Luke, a contemporary of Paul, the one who most likely told him the story, that act of injustice shaped him and helped make him into the kind of Christian he was. In the very same way that the greatest act of injustice, Jesus' trial, shapes us and makes us and should create in us an empathy for those who can't speak for themselves, an advocate for those who need someone to stand by their right hand side. There may have been no justice for Christ. The shouts may have prevailed that day, but they don't have to any longer. Heavenly Father today, may love prevail. May the hope we find in you rise from the ashes of a world that is so easily corrupted. Lord, I'm reminded of a dear conversation I had with a loved one. A conversation about goodness and evil. And how conditional life can be. And how true that statement is. And I'm reminded in this scripture that we have examined that the conditions that were set that ultimately let evil prevail, they could have been altered. They didn't, so that the sacrificial lamb, the Messiah, could take on the sins of the world, our sins, and every single person throughout human history, and cleanse us. And now the conditions are right for us to be courageous, for us to be brave, and for us to be just. And alter our lives, alter our desires, and yes, even alter our opinions 
to be a more empathetic people, to be a more gracious and loving people so that others don't receive the same fate as our Lord and Savior did on that day he went to the cross. In your heavenly Son's name we pray. Amen.